I'm Afghan Nifti, uh, the CEO of the Caspian Policy Center. Today we have a very interesting conversation uh, with our colleagues at the Caspian Policy Center. We are trying to uh, discuss the importance of the Caspian region, why is it important and why should we care about the region. This uh, program that we are starting will be uh, titling it as the Caspian Conversations. I hope uh, when you listen to this you will be enjoying it. Uh, we want to do it on a periodical level and uh, you know, host important guests on the uh, and the prominent voices on the critical issues of the Caspian region, uh, spanning from economy, security, energy, and the other uh, emerging challenges and opportunities in the Caspian region. Today, I have two esteemed guests, uh, two former ambassadors to the region, uh, retired ambassadors. Uh, one, Ambassador Richard Togold, who served in Kazakhstan. Mm -hmm. uh, I know and also Ambassador Sekuta, who served in Azerbaijan and many other countries. Both of the ambassadors have extensive uh, State Department and diplomatic career, but I try to uh, emphasize their uh, service, especially in the uh, Caspian region, the greater Caspian region. Uh, they are also a member of our advisor board here at the Caspian Policy Center. They are contributing immensely to our work here. So I'll first turn to uh, Ambassador Sikuda and ask the question, how would you define the Caspian region geographically? Well, I think in terms of the traditional geography, you think of the five countries that border the Caspian. But when I think you really think in terms of, of the modern realities, the economic realities, the cultural ties, how the countries see themselves. It starts in Turkey, extends through the Caucasus, and then into Central Asia, and then it would include Afghanistan. All these countries sort of identify themselves really as part of the Caspian region. It seems that Caspian is a key geographic point where we see a uh, you know, large span of uh, geography starting from Turkey, Caucasus, and Central Asia all the way to Afghanistan. Um, turning to Ambassador Poland, uh, what are the commonalities between the countries of the Caspian region? What factors define the region itself? Mm -hmm. uh, well, well, such diverse geography. Oh, yeah. 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 Absolutely. And indeed, they are diverse. After 30 years of independence, each country has now established its own identity. But there's a lot of commonality, too. And that is fundamentally, they are not Western. They do not have a Western history. They have 70 years of the Soviet Empire. They had the Russian Empire for a couple hundred years. And before that, Khanates and other empires. No Western history background. And that makes a big difference in how they organize society and government. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, I want to go back to Ambassador Sikuda and ask this question. What role does the Caspian region play in the global economy? Well, I think you know, traditional, well, actually, there are two traditional ways. Yes. One, if we think in terms of older history, as Ambassador Hoagland was saying, it was a transit area, it was a production area in terms of the Silk Road. And I think the important thing about the Silk Road is you didn't just load your camel up in Xi'an and offload yeah. at St. Mark's Square. Exactly. All along the way, there were cities and centers of production, centers of innovation. And that's something which is kind of coming back. The other traditional thing uh, that we've often thought about is in terms of oil and gas. This is a part of the world that was really at the beginning of the production of, of, of crude oil. And so the production of oil, then the shipment of oil out to the West, and then later natural gas. But what I think is interesting now is those same routes that were set up for the uh, production and shipment West of oil and natural gas, so Bakabili's Jihad pipeline, Southern Gas Corridor, are also routes that are becoming important again for transportation, for, for the transportation of goods, um, overland roads, and new railroads, um, and even now discussion about uh, uh, fiber optic cables. So there's a lot that's really going on in this area, and it's kind of coming back together as a connection between Western Europe and China, but also between India and the West. Uh, Ambassador Hogan, uh, we covered the economic side of the Caspian, perhaps on the politics of the Caspian, where the region sits in the global sea. Where do they fit into the global system? Yes. Well. Uh, each of these countries is independent. That has to be absolutely recognized. And they protect their independence. They can be members of the OSCE, which is Western. They can be members of the SCO, which is Chinese dominated. They can be members of the Eurasian Economic Union, which is Russian dominated. 
They have their memberships. They have multiple memberships. They even cooperate with NATO. But first and foremost, they are independent and sovereign and intend to remain that way. Perhaps as a follow-up to this uh, topic, I want to go into U.S. role. How would you evaluate U.S. role? How does it fit in their multi-vector policy approach? Uh, they see the U.S. as a reliable ally in almost every instance. Uh, U.S. policy fundamentally for these countries is to support and protect their independent sovereignty and territorial integrity. Beyond that, we don't press, but the good news in even this current administration in Washington is that our budgets to help and support these countries have not fallen. Our budgets remain very close to what they have been since their independence. Thank you, Ambassador. And I want to turn to Officer uh, Buddha and ask this question that how do you think U.S. should engage from now on? We have invested a lot in the region in terms of politics and economics of the region. Uh, how do you see further U.S. engagement? Well, I think you know, the, the engagement has to be ongoing. And it's not just between governments. It's also with companies, the private sector, universities, uh, cultural institutions, museums, um, academic institutions. All these have to be sort of brought into the picture. And I think a lot of, them, a lot of these exchanges do take place but they don't often get the kind of coverage that the visit of a high-level official uh, will get. Yet these kind of connections are what really make the relationship. And they strengthen it not just in terms of how countries in the Caspian region see the United States, for example, but how Americans see these countries. And that is really important for Americans to understand this part of the world and see the really the, the tremendous art, the history, the music, the culture, the literature, and yet also the economic opportunities that are there. Yeah, fully agree. In the end, it's people to people relationships that will endure for the long term. Governments can have problems, people to people, that's where the key lies. Thank you uh, for joining me today. Uh, it was an, indeed an enjoying conversation with you. And I'd like to thank you for tuning us and listen to this uh, short conversation. We just uh, scratched the surface of large, uh, important topics, and we hope to continue the Caspian conversations with more voices down the road. Thank you.